Wow, it took five minutes to talk about stress and harm, so hopefully the rest of these um, components of research with humans will go a little faster. Informed consent, which is our next one, has come to be a standard in the practice of psychological research. Typically, individuals must read and sign a release that they've been informed of the general nature of the study, what their participation will involve, and that they understand they may voluntarily withdraw from the study at any time. And I feel like I need to point out here, I know you guys are all familiar with the Stanford Prison Experiment, and those participants had also signed these releases, but in the heat of the moment, or maybe we should call it the heat of incarceration, whatever you want to call it, they got wrapped up in the experiment, and they seemed to have forgotten that they actually had those rights. And for people who participate in studies that are below the age of consent, parents or guardians must sign a release for those children. And recently, the consent of not only individuals who participate in the studies is needed, but also the consent of the institution through which the researchers might contact the people that they're looking for is needed. And this is particularly true when dealing with special populations, um, school children, prisoners, mental health patients, those kinds of people. Um, so th there's a lot of a lot of um, protection in place. Deception, you know, deception has come to be an important part of psychological research, whether we like it or not. Initially, they did single blind studies, and those were done to eliminate the possibility of bias in the results. If the participants knew that they were or were not getting some kind of treatment, drug, social conditioning, whatever, then they might act in accordance with those expectations and they wouldn't provide accurate data. Um, just think of it this way. Suppose you were doing a study um, to see who was more likely to help another person. If the participants knew that that's what the study was about, everybody in the study would be the most helpful person around. However, if they thought you were studying something else um, and somebody needed help, they would be more likely to act naturally. Does that make sense? We also have the double blind studies that came about later and those were devised to remove experimenter bias where the experimenter might unintentionally transmit clues to the participants about the way they're expected to act in a given situation and unknowingly affect the behavior of the participants and thus affect the data. And as a result, deception of participants and sometimes experimenters has been deemed essential to the science. Debriefing is where we the participants learn about um, learn about the deception if one has actually occurred. It's it's seen as an essential part of the study where the participants are given either the actual purpose of the study if they were deceived, or in some cases just more detailed information about the study and what contribution they've provided to it. And if the participants have been through any kind of stressful experience or asked to relive or report some kind of stressful experience, then that would be when counseling might be offered as well. Privacy and confidentiality. In all studies, participants must remain anonymous. Um, I, I think that this particular component cannot be stressed enough. And so they've came up with some rather unique ways to do that so that sometimes not even the uh, person in charge of the experiment, the psychologist, may know who the people are. Um, they do that by assigning the participants a code number and only the participant themselves knows both their name and their code number. They're usually asked to retain that code number as well in case they need it for anything later. We're going to talk about research with animals when we come back.